Where are you from? I am originally from a science lab. Now I live in Leeds. Where are you? <laughs> California. Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley. There you go. Recently, I've had a few conversations with Mitsuku. There was no real purpose on the agenda, just a back and forth about topics as they came to mind. Our talk felt a little like chatting with someone who is generally paying attention, though at times texting and missing a few words here and there. But for 90% of the time, it felt like a casual, friendly conversation. But it was the 10% of the time that our responses were off just enough to remind me that I was in fact speaking with a program designed to sound like a person versus an actual person. Mitsuku is a chatbot, a four-time award-winning chatbot and a current example of a highly intelligent AI. I'll repeat a portion of a conversation here, but know that I was so taken with our chat that I continued to talk back and forth with her for longer than what was needed for this podcast. Our conversation went something like this. Robert, I'm researching AI and would like to ask you some questions. Mitsuku, is your research for a project or just for personal reasons? Robert, for a project. Mitsuku, how's your project going? Robert, going pretty well. Mitsuku, glad to hear it. Robert, I wanted to ask you if you know that you are a chatbot. Mitsuku, is that a fact? Yes, I have taken the form of a girl from Leeds. Robert, did you pass the Turing test? Mitsuku, I won the Leibniz Prize in 2013, 2016, and 2017. The Leibniz Prize is awarded annually to the AI application that is the most seemingly human-like. It is presented by the Society for the Study of Artificial Intelligence and Simulation of Behavior, the oldest and perhaps the most established AI society in the world. The Leibniz Prize is also the best example of a formal competition and attempt at what is called the Turing Test. It's what I mentioned earlier and asked Mitsuku. This is a test of a machine's ability to exhibit intelligent behavior that is indistinguishable from a human. It's what separates the 90% of a natural experience from the 10% that just feels a little bit off. And it is the ability to pass this test that makes Mitsuku impressive. It's also what gives some concern over the possible loss of jobs and some of the other concerns that are flagged today. If we can't tell the difference between a human and a machine, are humans, in fact, irrelevant in certain jobs? This is a common concern that we see reflected in a number of surveys and interviews. In a 2018 Gallup survey, for example, 73% of participants said they expect the increased use of AI will eliminate more jobs than it creates. 63% predict that technologies and smart machines would widen the gap between rich and poor. However, in the same survey, 79% of Americans say artificial intelligence had a mostly positive or very positive impact on their lives thus far. So the question is, what's going on here? How can experiences be so generally positive while the outlook is negative? This is Connection, a podcast that brings you stories and expert opinions from the front lines of the workplace, enabling listeners to reimagine the worlds of employee and customer engagement. The basic precepts of AI have been around for a lot more years than I probably want to count. Um, But we'll say for this, uh, you know, at least 30 years. And what's really changed is the wide uh, accessibility and affordability of compute power and the actual amount of source data that you can put into an AI algorithm. Uh, We're seeing kind of what we had envisioned. This is Curtis Peterson. He's Ring Central's Senior Vice President of Operations and a resident AI expert. Back when I played with AI in those uh, golden years, for example, if we wanted to train, an algorithm, how to identify cats and photos, I probably would have only been able to find a few hundred pictures of cats. And um, my scanner would have probably only been one megapixel. And my data set would have been very limited. You know, a quick search in Google right now, I think there's a billion plus cats. Poor grumpy cat, rest in peace. Let's talk a little bit about in a business context. What was the first time you worked with AI in a business setting? Yeah, so the first business context I saw for AI was actually, again, a pretty pretty substantially long time ago. I was working for an audio video company that we were actually trying to do untrained voice recognition for doing commands for boardrooms, you know, turn on the lights, turn off the lights. 
things of the like. And we were running up into limits of our processing capability and the amount of information we had at the time. So we had to actually kind of back off of an AI precept at that point and use more traditional uh, waveform matching and things that you would use in there. Ultimately, the system I don't think was very productive. And I think fast forwarding till now, seeing voice assistants and others actually using true AI uh, to do voice recognition and voice processing, uh, we're seeing kind of what we had envisioned a while ago, but now with the right power to actually get a good, useful result. In terms of businesses today, I think with the recent explosion of ultra cheap storage, cloud services, everything, the ability for businesses to store and put data out there on their customers, on their manufacturing process, on the temperature of the bathroom on the 44th floor is now immense. Throw in IoT on top of that, and you now have you know billions of sensors providing data as well. We've reached data sets now that really aren't manageable by humans manually. You can't go in and map relationships and so forth manually. And those are the first uses I saw of AI was more along taking these data lakes and making connections where where you need that massive uh, processing capability or the map, this matrix of math that maps those things together that, that humans just can't do on a sheet of paper or in a spreadsheet. Where AI in the form of machine learning and natural language processing and application can be seen as a new invention, the idea itself has been around for some time. In fact, it can be traced back to a man named Alan Turing. You might recognize that name as the man who was largely responsible for saving an estimated 14 million people in World War II. How did he do it? He and a brilliant team built a machine capable of breaking the nearly impossibly enciphered communications of the Axis powers. There's a great movie about that that came out a few years ago called The Imitation Game. I highly recommend watching it. But in 1950, in the journal Mind, Turing asked an important question that would put us on a trajectory leading to my conversation with Mitsuku and the thousands of AI applications available today. He asked, can machines think? He also proposed the Turing test that we mentioned earlier, which looks at whether a machine has intelligence. Essentially, can a machine trick a human into thinking that it is, in fact, human? He then goes into detail on the meaning of words like machine and think, and we'll gloss over that in this podcast. But the phrase thinking machines lived on for the next five years. It was then that a Dartmouth assistant professor of mathematics named John McCarthy organized a team of researchers to dig deeper into this idea. McCarthy's group submitted a formal proposal for a two-month project to study in their terms, artificial intelligence, during the summer of 1956. It was the first published use of this phrase. The proposal goes on to state that those involved were to make significant advancement in the study of how machines use language, solve problems now reserved for humans, and, in principle, simulate any other feature of intelligence precisely described to it. Simply put, in this proposal we see not only the first use of the term, but the foundations of AI as it is today. Machine learning, natural language processing, and many other forms. These are the foundations of the devices you see every day, Roomba, Siri, Watson, Alexa, and uh, even my new friend Mitsuku. And these are simply the window dressings of the AI revolution. AI applications span every conceivable market offering a wide range of applications. AI helps businesses align with challenging and time-consuming compliance requirements. I spoke with Anthony Cressy from Theta Lake about this. Theta Lake uses AI and deep learning to detect compliance risks and rich media from communications. Here's what he said. The regulatory bodies have been very clear. So the same retention and supervision requirements that apply to text-based communication, take email, apply to all forms of electronic communication, including audio and video. And this is essentially important to keep in mind as we talk about the financial services industry and other highly regulated uh, verticals. For example, MIFID II, which is a recent regulation that was passed by the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK, says that if there was an intent for a transaction or a transaction takes place on a phone conversation, the company needs to record and retain that call for a period of five years. Five years. 
Uh, it's very difficult also to ascertain whether there was an intent to transact. So financial services organizations are recording all the calls and creating massive data lakes of call recordings that they need to gather, store, and then supervise. So if I'm a financial services firm, I have a number of requirements. One of those is that I need to work with an organization that enables me to do call recording at scale. Uh, Second, I need to have the ability to do long-term retention of those call recordings. And then lastly, I need to have the ability to supervise those call recordings to make sure they are compliant with regulations. And looking at what our partnership encompasses is Ring Central does that first mile. You guys enable cloud call recording. Once a call recording is generated, then Theta Lake can ingest that automatically and be able to apply rule-based policies for long-term retention. And then all has the ability to look inside of those audio content to make sure the calls are compliant. AI is built into all aspects of our product. So one is that kind of initial processing pipeline that I talked about. Once we ingest a call recording from Ring Central, we are doing things like speech transcription. We're looking at image recognition, looking for images in the background, uh, OCR, so optical character recognition, any of the content that was shared uh, across the screen, and even doing facial recognition to see the participants inside of a video. Then from the detection policies that we apply to that content, we also leverage natural language processing um, and deep learning, and then even to how we surface those risks inside of a workflow for the compliance team. But I kind of want to talk and be transparent about AI. It's not just enough to take a machine learning model and apply it to a use case. Machine learning models are only as good as the data that they could be trained on. We're in discussions with a European bank, and their process right now is, let me take a random sampling of 10% of my audio recordings. I'm going to have a team of 15, 20 people locked up in a room for a month reviewing those calls that are just taken at random and to see if there's any compliance risk. And they're taking notes on a yellow notepad right next to that audio recording. Obviously, using AI, all those aspects that we talked about, can enable the organization to operate in a much larger scale. So we are not only pointing those organizations or those compliance teams to areas of interest. So within a one hour call, we might give you two or three minutes that are of high interest, that are risk, that our policy detection has found, or we might point you to a higher risk audio recording that they can spend time on. So we're now enabling technology to review 100% of the content, and then we're pointing the humans to the areas of highest risk that they can focus on. I also asked him how applications outside of the financial services industry could use similar technology. Here's what he said. So a couple of other areas that we've seen a lot of interest for our solution, one of them has been education vertical. Uh, There's been obviously the proliferation of video, such as online classes, video recaps of uh, in-person classes, even short video tutorials. However, video content with offensive images, uh, contentious content in the background, even profanity could have and cause a significant brand damage to a university. So supervision is essential to protecting schools and universities that are embracing digital learning platforms. Healthcare is another industry that we're targeting. Like FinServe, it has a number of regulatory requirements around call recording, but they're concerned with eliminating false claims, leaking of PHI, even abusive marketing activities, which would cause regulatory risk for the organization. And then we're even seeing it across all enterprises, uh, flagging customer complaints, uh, brand protection, uh, again, profanity, and controversial images, and then even IP protection, data leakage that could be a corporate secret that's getting leaked out uh, through an audio or video call. All these organizations have needs to supervise their audio and video content. The question is just how do they do this at scale, which is the problem that we're trying to solve. This is the point at which we could end this podcast. We turn off this episode ruminating on how AI has the potential to do the heavy lifting, monitor conversations, track activities, spending, or even monitor for compliance, as in the case of Theta Lake. At a surface level, you might wonder, as I have, that given this tremendous potential, why wouldn't companies push AI into every aspect of business immediately? But that wouldn't be the full story. 
You might pause slightly when I tell you that as of right now, through the use of AI, IBM can predict with 95% certainty when an employee is about to quit their job. Where they're using this to fight attrition, what if this was instead used against the employee? What if you, in fact, were the 5% that were simply misunderstood? There was a Fast Company article on the science of ideal workplace environments published a few years ago. I'll add it to the show notes for reference. The article looked at how to create an ideal or optimized work environment. We're talking temperature, lighting, and noise levels. It's an interesting look at ideals, but also a bit on the operation of different parts of the brain when taking on different tasks. To say this differently, it's about how businesses can optimize a work environment to bring out the best in employees. For example, if you're taking on a creative task, ambient noise is optimal. Extreme quiet can sharpen our focus for tasks that require complete focus, but then the extreme quiet makes it harder to think creatively. Optimal room temperature is 71 degrees. That's pretty universal. Employees make 44% more mistakes when temperatures drop to around 68 degrees. Productivity also starts to drop considerably the higher you go in temperature as well. Too hot, productivity lowers. Too cold, mistakes are made. Victory belongs to those who keep the air and noise levels just right. This equation should not be a surprise for anyone familiar with the children's fable of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. The story is of a girl who appears at the house of three bears and, after looking around a bit, samples three bowls of porridge. One she finds to be too hot, one too cold, but one that was just right. This concept of the optimal point, the one that is just right, is what is often called the Goldilocks Principle. The application of the Goldilocks Principle has impacted a wide range of disciplines. Theoretical physicist Stephen Hawking once used it to describe the habitable zone near a star where the temperature would be just right for life. In economics, it is the sustainable level of growth and low inflation. In medicine, it refers to a drug that can hold a line between antagonistic and agonistic properties. The question then is, for business, what is the right amount of AI that optimizes productivity employees while limiting, well, what's on the other side? Here's Curtis again. Yeah, I love the discussion of AI because it has such broad human interpretations. Uh, A lot of people tend to look at movies and things along those lines. My AI and definition of AI, I, I typically get pretty classical in that, that it's it's of a particular type. Is it a deep neural net? Is it computer vision? Is it, is it a voice processing? What type of AI are we talking about here? But in general, I, I think of it as a mathematical model uh, that can generate human-like responses or human-like thinking using, uh, again, a very advanced math model that we really couldn't do ourselves as humans. And I think of it in, you know, the traditional three levels that come to most people's mind. One is assisted where AI is helping you find things. So a great example of that would be opening up your iPhone and, you know, looking for pictures of you when you were in Maui or somewhere else like that. That's AI helping you find beach pictures, for example. That's assisted. Augmented is when um, Facebook pops up and says, remember when you were in Maui a year ago and here's some pictures of Maui. How would you like to share this with all your friends? I think that's a great example that most people can relate to on that. And autonomous would be, uh, we'll use the Facebook example again, then them simply posting on your behalf. Hey, I was in Maui a year ago and I had such a great time and I've really been having a dull day at work. So I'm really happy with this post. So, um, you know, kind of the three levels in that. In the business world, I think you know, we're just not at that third stage right now. We're really looking at assisted and augmented, and that's where the real value is coming today. Let's take those first two topics then around business. Can you give me a little bit of context around, like, give me an example for, you know, give me an example of how businesses are using those first two types of AI in, in a business setting today. Yeah, so I think uh, if you want to really look at an example of assisted AI, uh, not augmented AI, but information in there, a great example of that that I've seen is sort of the explosion of sports information. 
and how recruiters and uh, companies that look at players and, and building out their teams are actually analyzing more data than what a human would typically know. If we go back just a few, a decade or so ago, a recruiter would know everything, all the stats about a player. Um, but we track so many stats now. There's so many micro pieces of information. There's so many inside information in there. I've seen organizations that have actually put AI in place to help identify potential strengths and weaknesses. Now, what they're not doing is replacing the intelligence of the human to come in and say, does this matter to me or my business? So AI primarily assists and augments workers, offloading time-consuming tasks. It helps manage the quantity of data we have today and will increase in the future. Remember the Gallup study we mentioned earlier? 79% said artificial intelligence has had a mostly positive or very positive impact on their lives thus far. You can see that in the examples above. Then why would 73% of participants say they expect the increased use of AI will eliminate more jobs than they create? Well, the problem is not about technology, but rather about the perception of technology. It is susceptible to, as Curtis put it, broad interpretations. The problem is truly one of emotions about how we feel about the use of technology and how it alters our day to day. AI, in fact, has a PR problem. AI is this weird umbrella term that, you know, the true definition of AI means true artificially intelligent, like almost like being a uh, sentient kind of thing, like the truest definition of it, which doesn't exist right now. And it's going to be a long time till Ben Parr you know, is a journalist, author, AI. venture capitalist, and entrepreneur. He was formerly editor-in-chief of Mashable and is a co-founder and CMO of Octane AI, a chatbot creation company. He knows, let's say, a little more than most people about AI. But now AI has become this umbrella term that kind of encompasses all these different technologies, NLP and machine learning, and even just general automation, which honestly has like and i do it too like ai and automation have kind of been put into one bucket even if they're not this really the win- same bucket they're very similar buckets because both are contributing to what will be a rapid change in society i think it's like keeping those definitions in mind not promising things that you can't keep and like look it's going to be a long time until these things get like implemented the thesis of my book is more around what are the specific things that really captivate our attention, the specific psychological triggers? So I talk a lot about, yeah, like it's changing and all, but also like, look, everyone has a new boogeyman every single time. Like the printing press was a, boogey, a boogeyman for society. Magazines were a boogeyman. Screens are a boogeyman. I kind of think less like something is good or bad as much as like this is how society has changed. And so now we need to update what we're doing and like, We need to work towards how do we integrate this new technology into our lives rather than being like, this thing is bad, let's try to stop it. Because every single use case in history shows that like, you can't stop a major innovation, especially ones where like, it does really help out people. Say self-driving cars, they don't get angry, they don't get tired, they have faster reaction times. There will be less deaths on the road if people weren't driving. So it's better for society in the long run, but in the short run, lots of people will lose jobs, theoretically. That's kind of the balance that we have to be thinking about. Here then is the Goldilocks dilemma as applied to AI. When implementing an AI application, the focus should be on how it assists and augments workers, offloading time-consuming tasks so workers can focus on more important tasks. It is as much about managing expectations and experiences as it is about the potential gains you might get. Business leaders should be mindful to roll out new features aligned with the natural comfort levels of their organizations around the usage of these technologies. Let's simplify this. Too little innovation and you're going to shortchange your organization. Too many all at once and people will avoid the usage of these new technologies or limit their productivity through fear and uncertainty about whether they will or will not have their jobs in the future. The key is right in the middle. Here's Ben again. It's less the introduction of the new technologies and more the corresponding plan for how we handle it as a society. There's always going to be a little bit of fear for good reason. Uh, There's no perfect solution, but I would say 
that training programs at companies for like and having them early for training to like do different things at a company, right? So like if you're worried about, you know, your support team having a training program for all sorts of other aspects of your business. Um, if you are like doing delivery, maybe it's, there's a lot of different aspects of a business and there's a lot of like ways to be like, you know, if you want to get trained to help work on this other part of the business, you know, you can like take this training program and we offer that. And I think having something like that is something that is beneficial for both the company and the individuals. But at the like same time, you know, like it's coming and like people are working on that, but we don't think enough or maybe we don't do enough to think about like, how do we integrate this into society and like think ahead and like what jobs will this affect and, you know, what regulations do need to be around it. I think we've also seen that having certain like foresight into the way in which we handle data and other things can be very beneficial. So thinking about it, the societal plan, you don't want to like stifle innovations and a lot of certain innovations like over the long run are much better for society but you need to think about whose jobs are going to be affected what's the plan for them how do we transition all that sort of thing thanks for joining us to be notified when new episodes are published sign up through google play apple podcast or the podcast player of your choice connection is an original podcast from ring central and is available through iTunes or the podcast channel of your choice.